Hi, hope you're all doing good. Today I'll be discussing about anatomy of pulp cavity. And before going into the topic, I would like to start with the quote of Low Halls, who said, Ability is what you are capable of doing. Motivation determines what you do. And attitude determines how well you do it. Right? So now let's move on to today's topic, that is anatomy of pulp cavity. So as you can see here, it's a three-dimensional CT image of pulp cavity of a molar. And you can see how complex the anatomy of pulp cavity is. And even studies have proved that even after completion of root canal treatment, around 30 to 35 percent of canal surfaces are being left untouched. So that shows how complex a root canal anatomy is. Right? Now today let's try to understand a few terms and the basic anatomy of pulp cavity, various canal configurations and the significance of apical foramen, right? So moving on to today's topic. First, let's start with pulp cavity. So what does pulp cavity mean? So pulp cavity is nothing but a space which is enclosed by dentin all over except at the apical foramen area. So in this image, if I can zoom in, you can observe clearly that this entire aspect within the tooth, this is an anterior tooth, you have a pulp cavity or space which is lined by dentin all over except at the apical foramen where the blood vessels or nerves enter or leave the tooth, right? Within this pulp cavity, you have different parts. For example, if you consider this as pulp cavity, the whole thing, that part of pulp present within the crown is called as pulp chamber and that part of the pulp present within the root can be considered as root canal. So pulp cavity can be broadly classified or categorized into pulp chamber and a root canal, right? Apart from that, you can see in this image a pulp horn and the roof of pulp chamber. And if I can zoom in, you can see here the pulp horn, where pulp horn is nothing but the accentuation of the pulp or extension of the pulp beneath a cusp or a prominence, right? Which is usually seen in the crown or coronal aspect of the pulp cavity. And each pulp cavity present within the crown called as pulp chamber is enclosed by a roof, a floor and corresponding walls, right? And now let's move on to the next slide. And you can see here how complex the anatomy is in the apical part of the root. As you can see here, we have a delta region. This is the terminal part of your root canal and this is the apical foramen. You can see a funnel shaped extension of apical foramen and this part of tooth which is traversed by a main canal as well as accessory canals can be ter termed as apical delta. So delta is basically an area which is traversed by numerous canals or water channels, right? So this delta represents the area of tooth in the apical portion of root which is traversed by numerous canals. It can be main canal or accessory canals. And here you can see this is the main canal and this is the lateral canal and these are accessory canals and the reported incidence of lateral canals is around 25 to 35 percent depending on many studies and there is a subtle difference between a lateral canal and an accessory canal the difference is that Lateral canal is anything. It can be either a lateral canal or accessory canal. These are branches from the main canal. Whereas a lateral canal is a branch of main canal extending only on the lateral aspects of a root. Whereas accessory canal is also a branch of a main canal which can be present anywhere in the apical area or even in furcation area. So in brief, all lateral canals or accessory canals and all accessory canals cannot be lateral canals, right? And now let's move on to the next slide. Here you can see the complex anatomy and structure of pulp cavity in a posterior tooth. And as you can see, we have numerous structures here. And also, if you can observe the difference between the first picture which I have shown and the third picture now, you can see that there is a distinction between the 
pulp chamber and root canal at this area. So this junction between the pulp chamber and root canal which is seen in posterior tooth can be considered as root canal orifice. Oh, so a root canal orifice is not a separate entity or structure but merely a continuation process of the pulp chamber into the root canal. So you find root canal orifices almost at the level of cement enamel junction right and you can see the different parts of pulp cavity within a molar you can see the apical foramen the canal orifices or root canal orifices and you can see that we have a floor in the pulp chamber formed by dentin a roof also formed by dentin and we have these pulp horns which are accentuation of pulp under the cusps and then we have various walls corresponding walls present within the pulp chamber right and now you can see in this image the same but you can see here various lateral canals and also accessory canals. So as I said, lateral canals do extend only on the lateral aspect of the root. So all lateral canals come under accessory canals, but all accessory canals cannot be included under lateral canals, right? And if you can notice one thing in the diagram, you have only one main foramen or apical foramen, but we can have several accessory foramens because we have several accessory canal openings, right? And now, after understanding the basic anatomy of pulp cavity in any tooth, now let's see the radiographic features of these canals. And if you can observe in these diagrams, let me zoom in each diagram. So in the first image you can see that the root canal is almost straight without any curvature. Right? But if you observe this second image, you have root canals which are having gradual curvatures and they are having more or less a straight opening. Right? And in the third image, you can see a gradual curvature of all the canals starting from the crown towards the root apex. And then if you can observe this image, we can see a sudden curvature or extreme curvature in the apical third of the root. The same in case of this final image also where you can see a drastic or sudden curvature in the apical third of the root. So the success in negotiating these curvatures depends on many factors and these root canal curvatures can extend from 20 degrees to 30 degrees and we have numerous methods to calculate this curvature and the success of negotiating these curved canals depends upon the skill of the operator which comes the last but most importantly it depends upon the degree of curvature the size of the canal and the ability of the instrument to negotiate the canal that is the flexibility of the instrument and finally the skill of the operator even a narrow curvature of around 20 degrees or a minimal curvature of 20 degrees will be difficult to negotiate if the canal is narrower However, even a curvature of up to 30 degrees can be negotiated easily if the canal is wider. So it means, so width of the canal also plays a major role in the success of negotiating a particular canal, right? So this is in brief about canal curvature and its significance. And then, as I have shown you in the first slide, the complex root canal anatomy as visualized in a three-dimensional CT, so it's understood that root canals are not plain conical structures, right? So we have different root canal configurations, different ramifications within root canal and for sake of convenience, various scientists have given various classifications of root canal configurations, different root canal configurations, starting with vertices classification and then we have veins classification and another classification given by Joe et al based on the cross-sectional shape of a root canal. So first let's see vertices classification. The first three types end with a single canal in the apex, whereas the next four types end with two canals at the apex and the eighth type ends with three canals at the apex. So if you can remember this point, then it will be easier for you to understand and to remember this entire classification. And now let's move on to Wien's classification where we have four types of canal configurations. The first one is 1, 2, 1. 2 2 and 1 2 configuration right so it's understood so the first one there is only a single canal the second one two canals joining into one third canals we have two separate exits that is 2 2 and fourth one 1 2 that is one canal bifurcating into and exiting as two different foramina 
And now we have another classification based on canal cross-sectional shape given by Zhao et al. Where we can have either round, oval, long oval, flattened or ribbon or irregular configuration. So these are the basic configurations of canals given by different authors, right? And now let's see what is isthmus within a canal. So isthmus is nothing but in English literature, isthmus is nothing but a piece of land with water on either sides connecting two larger lands or two larger areas, right? So isthmus is nothing but a bridge-like structure. Similarly, isthmus in anatomy or in anodontics means a narrow opening or a narrow faint communication between different canals or within a canal, right? So here you can see within a canal you have a narrow communication, but in this image you can see a faint communication between two canals, right? So that is isthmus. And Kim et al. have given a classification of isthmus where we have five types of isthmus classifications or five probable ways of locating isthmuses within the canals. So these are the cross-sectional images as you can see. And if I can zoom in, type one, you can clearly see that there is a short but complete isthmus, right? And type two, you can see that the isthmus is complete and also very elongated, right? And type 3, you can see that the isthmus is complete, however, it is very short. And type 4, you can see that it can be either a complete or incomplete isthmus, which is longer. And type 5, you can see an incomplete isthmus, I'm sorry. Type 5 is an incomplete isthmus with or without any communications, right? So this is the classification of isthmuses given by Kim et al. And now moving on to the final aspect that is apical foramen which is the most important anatomical landmark. As you can observe in the image, let me just zoom in. You can see that we have a funnel shaped opening with a major foramen here and a minor constriction or minor foramen which is 0.5 to 1 mm within the anatomic apex. And then we have pulp, dentin, cementum and CDJ, the most important histological landmark that is cementodentinal junction. And here you can see that this is the anatomic apex and also this forms the radiographic apex. That is when you take a radiograph, the apex which you, for, which you see is your radiographic apex, right? So we need to understand this because root canal Biomechanical preparation as well as obturation do terminate at specific landmarks here. So once we understand the concept of apical foramen, we can perform better endodontics, right? And now let's go through the details. So as I said, initially in case of young permanent tooth, we have wider canals and also wider apical foramen which is funnel shaped and it is filled with periodontal tissue. So as age progresses, there is deposition of cementum and dentin and the cementum deposition even forms inwards. That is even the cementum gets deposited inwards. So as a result, CDJ shifts inwards. That is, it's not present exactly at the apex, but usually studies have shown that CDJ is present 0.4 to 0.7 mm short of anatomic apex in many cases, right? And also, if you can observe here, we have anatomic apex somewhere here, whereas apical foramen is somewhere here. So, as you can see in this image, Apical foramen doesn't always coincide with your anatomic apex. So if you observe the first diagram on the left, you can see that apical foramen is far away from the anatomic apex, right? Here it is slightly closer but not exactly at the anatomic apex and here it is opening directly at the anatomic apex and here you can see double curvature of the canal and the lateral opening of the apical foramen. And studies have clearly shown that in around 17 to 35 percent of the cases, apical foramen coincides with anatomic apex. And in rest of the cases, we usually have apical foramen 0.5 to 1 mm short of anatomic apex as evident in these images, right? And now let's come back to this diagram the illustration of the apical foramen and anatomic apex and as you can see that apical foramen is 0.5 to 1 mm short of the anatomic apex and the cementodentinal junction is way inside the canal and it is obvious that biomechanical preparation should terminate at the CDJ because most of the infection is confined to dentin and so there is no point in going beyond the CDJ point and preparing the canal. But since it is not 
clinically possible for us to locate a cementodentinal junction, we take up this minor constriction as a clinical guide and we try to terminate our biomechanical preparation till this minor constriction which is usually 0.5 to 1 mm short of the apex, the radiographic apex. So radiographically we can terminate our biomechanical preparation as well as obturation 0.5 to 1 mm short of radiographic apex in case of an IOPA. So this is about apical foramen and its configuration and its position and now in this image you can see this is a scanning electron micrographic image of a maxillary first molars mesobuccal root where you can see a main foramen that is apical foramen marked in red and we have numerous accessory foramina also right so we have numerous accessory canals apical delta and numerous accessory foramen at the apex and this is a proof for that and as you can see in this image lateral canals and accessory foramina in an obturated tooth let me zoom in here you can see in this mesobuccal root there is penetration of sealer into the axillary canals right this is actually desirable however care has to be taken that there is no over obturation or no over penetration of sealer beyond the apex right and also Studies have shown that these accessory canals do contain pulpal tissue, right? And they, as the age progresses, as the age of the patient progresses, there can be obliteration of these accessory canals or lateral canals by way of deposition of either cementum or reparative dentin. And also, most importantly, in case of young permanent tooth or in case of young teeth where a root apex closure hasn't occurred yet, root canal per, can be performed in these cases and root canal is no way going to hamper the eruption of these young permanent teeth as shown in various studies right and then coming to root apex closure so this is regarding the effect of age on pulp cavity so before that coming to root apex closure usually in case of young permanent tooth the root apex closes two to three years after the eruption of these teeth. So understanding the eruption timing of these teeth helps us to estimate the root apex closure which is very much essential in order to obtain proper obturation, proper biomechanical preparation and also proper periapical healing in case where there is anodontic infection. Right? And now moving on to the effect of age on pulp cavity. In young patients usually we have a prominent pulp horns and large pulp chambers, patent dentinal tubules with primary dentin and secondary dentin as well, right? And also you have numerous lateral canals. As I said, the incidence of lateral canals is around 25 to 35% depending on many studies. And as the age progresses, one can clearly understand the fact that there is recession of these pulp horns, there is decrease in height of the pulp chamber because of numerous factors including formation of tertiary or reparative dentin and also the dentin which is formed as a result of these noxious that is the reparative dentin is more atubular, more coarse and also the overall water content or moisture content in the dentin decreases and most importantly lateral canals incidence decreases as the age progresses because of deposition of a tertiary dentin or even because of cementum formation, calcification etc. So these are few of the age changes happening within this pulp cavity and understanding these basic anatomical features of pulp cavity is very much essential for any dentist and endodontist as well and once we understand the basic anatomy it will be easier for us to perform endodontic procedures with precision and success. So this is about anatomy of pulp cavity.